everyone. This is Diane Dohm with the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, or the Lake Superior Quinn, which represents Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Quality Improvement Organization Program. I'd like to welcome you to this educational session entitled Outbreaks, Identification, and Management. All lines will be muted during the webinar. However, after the presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. So either place your questions in the chat or the operator will give us directions at the end on how you can get into the queue to ask your question. A little bit about my background. I am a nursing home project specialist with Metastar, currently assisting Wisconsin long-term care facilities with enrollment in the National Healthcare Safety Network, or NHSN, as well as reduction of C. difficile infection, antibiotic stewardship, and infection prevention and control. I am a certified medical technologist with a bachelor's degree in business and have been board certified in infection prevention and control since 2008. Happy to have you all with us today. So today is the third call in our six-part series. This series is meant for the beginner infection preventionist or as a review for the more experienced IP. It's a very high-level overview of the basics. I could obviously spend an entire day on any of these topics. Calls are not meant to be a substitute for the uh, phase three final rule statement of completing specialized training in infection prevention and control. Uh, CMS, we really don't know what exactly they're going to be requiring. Um, at a meeting last week, CMS stated that it will be early 2019 before the final details are released on what will exactly constitute that specialized training. In the meantime, I'm hoping that these calls are very helpful to you. Again, as usual, questions can be placed in chat. We will answer or ask them at the end of the program. So today's objective, we want to be able to recognize the early indications of a possible outbreak. We want to initiate containment strategies, notify all appropriate parties, and conduct a post-outbreak learning session. For those of you who have experienced and survived an outbreak, this may not be new information, but may prompt you to look at the process in a slightly different way. Your policy for outbreak investigation really needs to be very detailed so that anyone can follow it. For example, an agency staff person on a weekend. You need to have your outbreak measures stated in your policy that will be initiated whenever there is an increase in illness above the expected amount or the baseline, when you hit what you've determined is your trigger for action. Now, the general definition is typically the presence of three or more residents and or staff experiencing symptoms within a 72-hour period in the same area, the same wing, the same floor. If you have more specific definition for um, a specific illness in your state memo or guideline, be sure to use that. But you really want to make sure that your staff is aware of that process. Again, anybody should be able to start this process. Outbreak management often seems overwhelming when you're in the middle of it because really all these steps need to be done almost simultaneously. You need to recognize it, start to contain it, notify everyone, all at the same time. And that will, of course, reduce the severity and the length of your outbreak. But early recognition is really the key that starts all these processes in movement. So again, we talked about it being really more illness than usual. Know what your trigger, what have you determined for your facility to be your trigger for action. That definition can vary by either the disease or the state that you live in and the guidelines and the rules that you're following. But you want to make sure that you have surveillance mechanisms in place, such as your line listing of all the ill residents as well as the line listing of staff with those disease symptoms. Look at your 24-hour logs for ill residents. Communication between shifts becomes very important to keep that up to date. And who monitors your staff calls, call-ins? 
depending on the size and the structure of your facility, the infection preventionist might not be the person who gets the information from the staff call-ins. But they need to be able to put that together with the resident illness to really get a complete picture of the scope of the outbreak that you might be dealing with. So be sure you have a process if you are not the one who gets the information for those staff call-ins to make sure that information comes to you in a timely manner, meaning the day that they're calling in. As soon as you recognize that you have an increase in illness and outbreak, you really want to start immediately to try and contain it, to keep it from spreading. Those strategies will depend somewhat on what's causing your outbreak and what your state requirements are. You want to work with your local health departments to really determine those best strategies. Are transmission-based precautions indicated? Do you need contact, isolation, transmission precautions, droplet, accommodation? We talked on our last call about the CDC's type and duration precautions, Appendix A, and the link is there in your slide. That is really a very good resource that you should have available for all your staff. If you keep a paper binder with things in, that is one uh, resource that should be in that paper binder. Contact crop. Precautions, probably the one most commonly used, especially for all your GI outbreaks. Really, the purpose is to prevent that transmission from person to person or person to environment to another person. You want to be able to use gloves and gowns for any direct contact with the resident or their contaminated environment. You want to don that prior to going into the room, so then put it on before you go into the room. We now know really the large role that the environment may play in transmission. So think about your shared equipment, your resident surroundings, any anything that can be carried essentially to the next resident by your staff. We're going to be talking a lot more about transmission-based precautions in our next call, which will be March 20th. So besides contact precautions, you frequently will be using droplet precautions, and the purpose for that is to prevent transmission or spread through respiratory secretions or mucous membrane contact. The personal protective equipment indicated here is typically a mask for close contact. Again, you want to don it or put it on prior to entering the room. So besides thinking about what personal protective equipment you need to have, think about do you have adequate supplies? Is it located as near as possible to the point of use? So where is it that you're going to need it? Can you have it be right outside the room entrance? And again, that personal protective equipment should be put on prior to entry to the resident room. When you have dual occupancy rooms, another point to really keep in mind when you're training your staff is that that PPE should be changed before they move from caring for one resident and another resident. And there's often confusion on why staff have to wear the PPE in a resident's room when providing cares, but yet a, a resident can come out of their room. So again, we're going to talk about that balance. Um, the personal protective route equipment really prevents contamination of the staff's body or their clothing so they don't become ill themselves, so they don't take it home to their families, and they don't take it to the next resident they assist with cares. Sure, we have all had experience with gastrointestinal illness. I just want to review some of the specific contain measure, containment measures specific to GI illness. So soap and water is indicated for hand hygiene versus the uh, alcohol-based rub. A mask and goggles or a face shield should really be used if vomitus is present. So I'm just going to close my email here so you don't see those pop up. Bleach-based cleaners, whether it's premix, as most of us use these days, or if you are diluting bleach down to a 10% solution, you want to make sure that you're mixing that fresh every day, every 24 hours. Your staff should be taught to clean the most contaminated areas of a room last. 
The guidance tells us to change mop heads whenever a new bucket of cleaning solution is prepared if you're using wet mops. One thing that often gets missed, you want to steam clean carpet and upholstery if it's soiled. You don't want to let it dry and then vacuum it because that can really recirculate the virus. So in general, when you're talking about containment, let me talk a little bit about this for GI on this. Think about cleaning and dis disinfection. Are special products indicated? Should the frequency of cleaning be increased, especially in those common areas and with frequently touched objects? Objects. If you do increase your frequency for cleaning, you want to continue that for 72 hours after the last case has recovered. Be especially vigilant with your medication cart, your vital machines, anything that's going from room to room. You want to make sure that you're cleaning that before and after use. Try and make it easy for your staff if at all possible and dedicate commonly used equipment if you have the amounts and resources to do that. So when we talk about containment strategies to consider, notice the word consider. You are literally always doing a risk assessment to maintain that balance between containing the outbreak, preventing that transmission, and doing the least restrictive containment that we can do for our residents. So you want to restrict, of course, an ill residence activities until 48 hours after symptom resolution. You want to minimize movement of residents from affected locations to unaffected locations. Evaluate the need to cancel group activities on that affected unit until 48 hours after the well date of the last case. Now, in the Wisconsin Guide for GI Illness, it says specifically that non-ill residents should not be confined or restricted to their rooms during outbreaks. But you need to think about your facility and, again, really do that risk assessment. Should they, if they are not ill, where should they be able to travel to? Um, we've had facilities really have to do a, a really hard risk assessment when they had two floors in their facility. The dining room was on the lower floor, so all the residents from the upper floor had to come down to the dining room on the first floor. So how do you handle that in an outbreak? You need to think about those types of things ahead of time. What other options do you have? Again, that's your risk assessment that you're doing. You also really want to be able to document that risk assessment. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on, about how you want a state surveyor, when they come in and ask you why you did X, Y, and Z, you want to have the written documentation on what you determined would be your actions via that risk assessment. Consider limiting new admissions or at least admit them to the unaffected area or um, where all the residents have been asymptomatic for at least 48 hours. Inform prospective residents and healthcare providers about your ongoing outbreak. This is something that you really do need to share um, as part of your, uh, when you're looking at taking in a new resident. And if you're transferring residents for any reason, be sure that the EMS and the receiving facility are aware of your outbreak. Even if you're transferring a resident for, say, a fall with major injury, you want to let EMS know and the hospital that they're being uh, taken to for evaluation that you are perhaps in the middle of a GI or a respiratory outbreak so that they can take the appropriate precautions. Family and visitors are often a challenge. You really want to notify them of what's going on with your outbreak. Uh, each facility probably has a little bit way of doing that. Some send letters when there is an outbreak. You all are posting signage alerting visitors of the outbreak. You're trying to, of course, encourage non-essential visitors to reschedule their visit. But often those visit visitors who come want to come. So then we have to look at how do we educate them and what they need to do to prevent acquiring that illness, what PPE, personal protective equipment, if anything, they need to wear. And again, you want to document that if you have a visitor who you've done your education on and they refuse to wear 
that surgical mask when, they are, when their loved one is in droplet isolation for influenza. You really need to document that as well. Think about your staff. Certainly an outbreak is a stressful time for them as well. Is there additional education that needs to be done? If you were lucky enough to not have one for a long time, any in-services that you need to do? Is it possible to maintain the same set staff assignments for the residents? You want to try and limit staff moving from an affected area to an unaffected area? Staff should exclude themselves from resident care at the onset of symptoms if they become ill when they're at work and actually leave work. They know that this can be hard, especially when you're short of staff. Staff can be hesitant to go home or to stay home when they're ill due to the need for hours and income, due to the fear of getting fired or the fear of letting their coworkers down. But that really is an important part of limiting or containing that outbreak. Are your staff illness policies clear on the time that they need to be excluded from work? Generally, it is 48 hours after symptom resolution. But again, you want to make sure that that's spelled out in your policies and that, that your staff has been trained on how long they should stay out. And moving on to the notification part of outbreak management. So your unit staff will notify the person that's in charge or your infection preventionist if they're available. But what happens when that infection preventionist isn't there or your DON or your assistant DON isn't there? You want to make sure that your charge nurse has the information that they need from that outbreak management policy. They have all the appropriate numbers of the folks that they might need to notify. You're calling your medical director. You'll have to let all the care providers for those residents know to determine if any changes in their medical management are needed. Do you have sister facilities or adjacent facilities that may be sharing staff? If you have contracted ancillary services, you want to let them know, as well as the other ancillary services within your uh, facility, even if they are your employees, so dietary, housekeeping, maintenance, laundry, et cetera, all those folks. Be sure on your contact list that you're keeping your information up to date. With all the turnover that we experience and people changing cell phone numbers, et cetera, make sure that you have all the correct phone numbers so that anybody can use that list, whether it's your charge nurse again when they're alone on a weekend night shift, so that they can get a hold of the right people. Your local health department should be notified of any suspected or confirmed outbreak. They'll ask for your information on your line list. They'll want to know how many residents are affected, when they started with their illness. Um, they are, are the ones who will really guide your decisions on whether you need to obtain cultures or any other testing that might be done. Um, often they can do that testing for you if you're exempt. So local health department is a huge partner in helping you with an outbreak management. They can also advise your providers on treatment or prophylaxis of other residents and can help you evaluate the need for possible containment and confinement strategies. So again, when you're trying to do that risk assessment, they are an invaluable partner in trying to help you figure that out already. Uh, usually the process is that you'll be contacting your local health department and they'll contact the State Department of Public Health if, if they are so needed. After your outbreak, so you've survived, the outbreak is over, no new ill residents or staff for 48 hours, but you're not finished yet. Often the stuff that really gets forgotten is evaluating what happened during that outbreak. What worked well for you? What can you improve on or change for the next outbreak? We all know there will be a next one. What totally took you off guard and surprised you that you hadn't even thought about that you need to think about writing in your policy for next time? So you want to conduct that review of the outbreak and to document all actions that are taken and we'll talk about sharing them with your quality committee. So typically the infection preventionist is going to kind of take care of the first two bullets on this. They're going to make sure that line list is all complete. 
sometimes during the course of an outbreak you're so busy, you know, you miss a start date or a stop date for symptoms, you sort of forget to put on a well date. You want to make sure that that list, if you will, is completed so that when it is looked at by an outside party, everything will be there and everything will be complete. You want to think of this really as a narrative summary or a chronological timeline really of what happened, what actions did you take, what were the results of those actions. Okay. Then the infection preventionist will take that to the interdisciplinary team who does an evaluation of the outbreak once they have all that information. That team then really as a group, you're making recommendations for preventative measures, changes to the policy, maybe there's more education that has to be done. So any changes in your policy that or recommendations for change in your policy, when, when you make that change, you want to educate your staff on those changes. But it's also important to monitor whether those, those changes actually happen. In the heat of the moment, we often revert back to old practice. So you really have to keep an eye and make sure the changes that you make are really become hardwired and are truly um, carried out. Each outbreak really yields valuable information and it becomes almost a continual quality improvement cycle. So take what you learn from this, this outbreak and help design your actions for the next one. There's many, many good resources out there. First slide is a couple of general ones that you can use um, to, to look at outbreak management. So APIC has a great guide for long-term care. You'll find many good resources on the Lake Superior Quinn uh, website as well. And then each state really has very specific guidelines, um, especially for norovirus and for respiratory outbreaks. So you want to make sure that you are using the most current version. Typically your respiratory one gets updated almost every year. And the norovirus one probably not quite as often, but you want to make sure that you are using the most current recommendations that are out there. So Minnesota also has some great um, resources and references here as well as Wisconsin. So if you didn't have the latest copy of any of those, you can take those links from the slide as well. So we'll open it up for questions in a minute. You're also able to put them into the chat box. And if the operator could remind us um, on how to get in the queue for questions. Thank you. If you have a question, please press star than one on your touchtone phone. If you're using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star than one on your touchtone phone. So what I'd really be interested in is things that um, you have learned through outbreaks. What did you have to change in your process after going through an outbreak? Something you hadn't thought about before, but something that came up. So feel free to share those as well. I don't see any questions in our chat box, so feel free to enter them there as well. The link for the evaluation is on the slide um, right now. So once you click that evaluation and complete it, you will then uh, be linked to your, your certificate of attendance. Also, and we have a phone question. Thank you. Go ahead. Say Diet. Yeah, this yes. is Faye. Uh, and we just had, um, when you notify the health department, you know, the local health department isn't always open, so I think you have to notify the state when they're not. Is it I mean, after uh, hours? If it's after hours, weekends, holidays, I don't mm -hmm. think that they're open, so I believe you have to call. And usually we had the one outbreak and we called it in and and they kind of just said okay we we we'll, we know that and and so that they know about it so I believe you have to call the state too okay and that may differ from um, local health departments 
whether they are, you know, to have a 24-hour line or whether you want to make sure that you have the state numbers listed on your resources for your staff as well. But thank you for that reminder. Uh-huh. What are facilities sort of suffering through right now? Are you still seeing a lot of GI illness? Are you still seeing a lot of influenza? Now, I haven't heard um, quite as much as, you know, about a month ago, it seemed like there was more of both around, but I'm curious. So um, we have somebody that's saying, uh, some UTI infections and skin infections. So not necessarily an outbreak, but are seeing an increase in uh, rates of those. Another participant did have a flu outbreak recently. You know, it's been uh, kind of a rotten year for influenza. Another facility just getting over an influenza outbreak, influenza A outbreak, so definitely still around. What things are you learning as you're going through these outbreaks? Have you changed your practices? What kind of hints and helpful guidance can you give to the other participants on the line? A couple that have had norovirus. Uh, one that took from December through most of January. So some of these can be very long acting and hard to contain. Anything that you learned, again, we'd really love you to be able to share with the other participants on the line. And the housekeepers do more sanitation in common areas. Again, increase your, increase your frequency of cleaning especially with norovirus, seems to uh, be important. Another facility had norovirus in November and then influenza A in January, so no rest for the wicked there. Sounds like there's still a fair amount of illness out there. How do you, if you do, restrict visitation? I'm always curious about that. Um, I imagine most of you place signage. What other things do you do for your visitors? Again, a, res a participant noted that they had uh, influenza and norovirus back to back. Housekeepers increased cleaning and staff was very good with hand washing and gowning. So again, it becomes important for you to do audits on the compliance with that personal protective equipment. It's great to have it outside the room, but if your staff aren't using it, um, they really aren't going to be preventing that transmission. And we have the following question from Faye. Yeah, this is Faye. Um, I, we also kind of, you know, when we had the influenza afterwards, we kind of started the standing orders for the Tamiflu when an outbreak occurs through kind of through our medical director and, and such. Okay. So just, you know, I mean, you can always... So that way you can get a quick that, jump on the prophylaxis yeah, once you can, determine that you had an outbreak of influenza? Mm hmm So that you, we have that at, on our standing order so that we can start the Tamiflu. That first dose right away, I guess, is important that they get mm -hmm. that. Definitely. As as possible. It's a good idea. So, okay. Again, work through that with your medical director and your local health department. So we had a comment here from a participant too where they had a, a resident with significant dementia so really couldn't tell, you know, vocalize their symptoms. And so by the time that they realized that um, she was in the early symptomology of influenza, there were three others with elevated temps. So again, being very vigilant for that way. How do you provide contact precautions to all residents in the effect of a neural outbreak within the entire facility? You essentially are having that almost your facility is in um, isolation. So any time that your staff are doing cares, they really should be wearing gloves and gowns. More for 
you know, even if you think all your residents already have it and I don't need to protect or prevent, you know, a, a staff worker from carrying it from one resident to the next, you're trying to keep your, your health care workers and your staff from becoming ill as well. So really be vigilant on doing compliance auditing of your personal protective equipment usage, making sure that they're wearing the gloves and the gown, making sure that they're covering their mouth and their nose and their eyes, especially if they're cleaning, cleaning up vomit especially. Some other comments about wiping all the common areas three to four times a day with your special cleaners. They had norovirus in various parts of their building. Um, keeping really good track of the dates and the numbers and what you did. Had to re fill out a report for the health department at the beginning and at the end of the timeline and everything we did. And that becomes, as I was talking about, that narrative or the chronological really summary of everything that happened the actions that you took, were they effective, did you have to change your actions, that is what your state surveyors are expecting you to have when they come into your facility. That's what you're going to use to take and, and to that multidisciplinary group after your outbreak is over and really evaluate, did you do all the things that you, you should have done? You know, were, was your staff compliance? Did you learn new things so that you have changed your policy and next time we'll do something else? So another uh, comment from a participant, for those of you who have had influenza outbreaks, what was your staff flu vaccine rate like and did you have a mandatory masking policy? So if anybody wants to share information on that. A good point from another participant about um, posting visitor restrictions on social media and on your web page so that they found out before they traveled to your building that perhaps if they could delay their visit, they should. We play signage to encourage our visitors to gown. They seem to be great about the hand hygiene, but not about the gowning. So all you can do is really educate them. We can't force them to wear things. You educate them on the reasons why, and then make sure that you document that you've done your education. And keeping residents in their rooms is very difficult for independent and confused um, residents. So there again, uh, this participant has a great suggestion. Having staff assist them with frequent hand hygiene, not having any more contact with other residents that they can have. But I think that's really your hardest task is to try and contain the outbreak without restricting the freedom of the residents. You know, they seem like they, those two things really butt heads. So we really have to get creative sometimes about how we can provide services that the residents need, whether it be the social activity, whether it be, you know, the dining room activity, and, and still maintain that containment. I have some comments in the chat box about um, contacting the family first before giving prophylaxis. That would be a policy you should really have in place before your outbreak happens so that you have that process all taken care of. Another facility has, of course, hand sanitizer in the lobby as well as on the units. Question about being able to print the slides. You should be able to, and the link for that is on our website as well as when you register as well. Uh, within about a two week period, the um, recording and the slides will be also on our website, so you will be able to get it there as well. For a reminder about if you're using Tamiflu on your residence, you may need to think about having creatinine levels done before initiating. Um, due to the renal, potential renal toxicity. So again, all those things should be talked about with your medical director prior to the outbreak if you want to have a standing order like that. So another participant um, advising that they send letters to the family members and all the volunteers. So that's a really great point as well, trying to limit the visits making sure that they use the hand sanitizer and the mask that you're providing them. And I, I can totally um, agree with your, your comment on the challenge 
with cognitively impaired residents who require precautions and isolation. Trying to keep them in isolations and or in compliance with precautions is not really easy. It is going to take increased effort from your staff, you know, just to help them do their hand hygiene. Um, it is not an easy thing to manage, and again, it's a very difficult balance, especially for those patients. So lots of good pointers coming into the chat box, and we'll make sure and include all those in our summary Q&A afterwards as well. So earlier there was a question about the vaccination rate. Uh, this participant says it was their best year in the past nine years for staff getting the influenza vaccine and very good resident vaccine administration and still had the outbreak. Um, it's something that I think a lot of facilities have seen this year. It is always better to get the vaccination than not get it, but some years the vaccination is not as effective as we would like it to be. Another facility states that their influenza vaccination rate was 82 percent. Uh, they did not have mandatory masking if they did not get the vaccination. So does anybody out there do mandatory masking for those employees who choose not to get the uh, influenza vaccine? So one participant states that they don't have mandatory masking, but they do require staff who have not received the vaccine to stay home during an outbreak. Why well, then I'm sure it becomes really important to get those rates up there because we're all so short staff that I imagine that becomes a difficult thing for you as well. Another facility that has a 93% influenza vaccination rate. Um, they also have a mandatory masking policy, and many staff did get the immunization because they did not want to have to wear the mask through March 31st, which is kind of a, um, I want to say a relative date. You know, you really have to watch the season. Many times our influenza season is extended past March 31st. One of the best ways to determine that is to watch your weekly reports from your um, state public health department. So it sounds like many of you have very good influenza immunization rates. That's really um, great to hear. Some of you have mas mandatory masking. And a link to the handouts has been provided for you. One facility suggests having creatinine levels at the start of the season or with other labs that they might be having to have on hand for initiating that uh, prophylactic use if at all possible. And those things should be worked out with your medical directors. One participant lucky enough to have a pharmacist who gives them an updated list of every resident's grant and clearance monthly, which turned out to really be helpful to them. Another facility with mandatory masking when you are within six feet of a resident who has not received the vaccine. So that's really remarkable as well. Another facility with a vaccination rate of 86 percent, again, um, mandatory masking is in three feet of the resident. So I'm happy to see that some of you have some excellent immunization rates as well as mandatory masking if, if they're not. So, and a very good reminder from a participant, if you do mandatory masking or, or the use of masks in general, let's talk about that, they do have to be changed frequently. So there's not exactly a specific time limit, but any time they become damp, when you're in a residence room, if you're in there for a long process, but they really are considered a single-use item. So if you're going into a residence room to do cares, that mask should be, you know, thrown away as you come out of that room. It shouldn't be hung down around your neck for possible use later. 
So really watch compliance on your staff as well. So some great feedback from things that you folks have learned, things that might be helpful to your fellow peers on the call. So take a look at those resources, especially the ones that are specific to your state if you don't have those yet. Uh, making sure that you replace any outdated references that you have in your binders and your books or laying around so that you are using your most up-to-date references. So a good rule of thumb about it being changed every two hours. But again, remember that that mask is single use. So if they're coming out of that room, that mask should be thrown away. You should never be having that mask and going out to the nurse's station or going into another room. So that's just kind of general. When you think about personal protective equipment, it's to be used in that one time going into that resident room. And a participant states they have a, a policy of no masks in the hallway. Very good. And yeah, that really says it. One mask, one patient, another great reminder for your staff. Sometimes when they're really busy, you know, it's very tempting to just pull that mask down as you leave the room, knowing you're going to be going into another room, potentially of a droplet isolation resident, that they are single-use, disposable. You do not want to be wearing them outside the room. I love that one mask, one patient. And we have a question over the phone, Rob McCall. Go ahead, Rob. Hi, I just got a, um, an updated uh, Infectious Disease Society of America um, recommendations, mm -hmm. and I was concerned because it had recommendations for uh, C. diff. And so it's a little bit off topic on the outbreaks, but it's mm -hmm. um, in the recommendations it said, in routine or endemic settings, perform hand hygiene before and after contact of patients with CDI and after removing gloves with either soap and water or alcohol-based hand hygiene. Yes. I had a very big discussion at a recent infection prevention uh, meeting about that new IDSA guideline. But that actually does mirror CDC. Actually, if you look at what they say, too, that they say unless you're in an outbreak or an increased rate of infections for CDI, that you can use alcohol-based gel. I think we've in the long-term care setting, always taught our folks soap and water. Soap and water is typically better because of the friction, but I think that the concern really comes up when you think about we don't often have good places for our staff to wash their hands. Often they're using the resident bathroom, which is probably the most contaminated part of that whole room. So I think that you're going to see some debate going back and forth since those IDSA guidelines came out. Um, I personally would not change anything that you've taught your employees other than the fact that if they can't use that sink and the soap and water, at least do the alcohol to hand gel when you leave that room and then go to a sink and do soap and water. Okay, so I'm not going to start any conversation with this. If I honestly would. I think you're going to see a lot of conversation in the literature because this was kind of um, a, a big red flag to a lot of folks. But I think you really want to think about, you know, what what uh, materials your staff have to use. You know, have we made it so hard for them by saying that they have to do use soap and water that they are skipping the hand hygiene step because it's difficult to do. So I know that this is something that um, I'm on a group, the long HAI, Healthcare Required Infections and Long-Term Care State Coalition, and it's something that that group is going to be looking at as well. I mean, we want to make sure that we are giving our staff every opportunity to do their hand hygiene. Um, but I think that <clears throat> if you've got your folks trained to do soap and water, I wouldn't change anything right now. There was another question in the chat that I wanted to mention about RSV. Um, so when I mentioned that CDC type and duration, <coughs> excuse me, of isolation list, 
If you look up RSV, <coughs> excuse me, a little froggy. It actually says contact with a mask as part of standard precaution. So RSV is also spread by um, contact, so direct, direct patient to patient. So RSV is actually contact and a combination of contact and droplets. So if you are really seeing RSV in your facilities, that's one that sometimes gets missed because people tend to think of it as a respiratory illness, so they'll immediately do droplet precautions and the surgical mask, and that is a part of it. But the CDC actually labels that one as contact isolation because of the person-to-person -person contact transmission, and then using a surgical mask as part of standard precautions when you have an uncontrolled cough. So RSV can be a trickier one. Any other questions in chat? Or on the phone? No further questions on the phone. Thank you. So I would encourage you all to register for our next call on March 20th. We will be talking specifically about transmission precautions <clears throat> and that balance as we talked about between isolating the organism and not restricting the resident. I think that's sort of the biggest challenge of all this for you. Uh, so please register for that one as well. We will put all these Q&As into a document after the conclusion of the series. So if we don't get your questions or think of them later, please send them. Uh, my contact information I think might be on the next slide for you. So you can always send any comments that you have. And if you have questions about the transmission-based precautions in advance of, of the call in two weeks, send those as well and we can try and include as many of those as we can. I thank you for joining us today. Last chance for any questions. Anything in the chat or on the phone? Otherwise, we will be closing the call. Thank you very much for attending. Again, complete that evaluation that pops up when you close out of the webinar. That will then trigger the certificate of attendance. Thank you.